Good evening. Happy Sunday afternoon to y'all. Hi, oh, excited to be with you again this evening. What a grand and glorious day this has been. It was just wonderful to be in the house of the Lord together with uh, a group of y'all this morning. We just had just a best time and just um, so, so very thankful uh, for the opportunity to come back together um, in worship. So we're just thrilled uh, to be back together again with you this evening. And uh, just hope that some more are going to pop in and join us here in just a few minutes. So good evening. Um, hope you've got your uh, Bible handy and uh, your cup of coffee or uh, Dr. Pepper, whatever it is that you want to gather around with. But we're just so thrilled to see you this evening. So we got just a few minutes. I'm going to let y'all all, all uh, pop on and uh, say hi to each other. So, hey, Rebecca, good to see you. I'm continuing to pray for you, sweetie. Uh, got some waves going on right there, so uh, just thrilled to thrilled to be with y'all again this evening. Wow, we had a a really really uh, wonderful time just being in the house of the Lord this morning in the sanctuary. I know there were um, a number of you that you're not quite comfortable being out yet already with various things going on. We got some that were actually on vacation this weekend. Um, out and gone, and um, so we, we missed all of you. Uh, glad that you're tuning in online when you can't be with us, and that opportunity is going to continue. But boy, we were thrilled with the ones that were there. Um, we had a, a very good representation this morning, and uh, it was just good to be back together um, in the house of the Lord with, with those of like precious faith. So um, as, we, as we get started here, I just want to remind you that um, for the time being, uh, Sunday morning at 11 o'clock is the only service that we are having um, for the next week or, or two or three, um, trying to um, accommodate changes, changes that have to be made and everything. So the only one that we're going to have in the sanctuary is the Sunday morning 11 o'clock service. Um, Sunday school is still online. And uh, the evening worship is still online and uh, Bible study on Monday, Wednesday, Friday um, is still going to be online. And so we want you to avail yourself to all of those things. And we have more exciting things coming as we gather uh, back together more in the future. So um, another thing I want to remind you of, you know, um, if we had been to, to together on a regular basis, we would have reminded you this is the first Sunday of the month. And there's a couple of reasons that's significant. Number one is Mission Sunday, okay? So we want to remind you, don't forget about your missions pledges and don't forget to pray for your missionaries. Um, many of them are, are still um, on, on their housebound. They're still uh, not able to get out and, and not able to move about as freely as they would like. So continue to pray for them. It's also, uh, don't forget, you know, BGMC. Um, but we do something special. Uh, here at, at Butler First Assembly, the first Sunday, Monday, Tuesday of the month. Now, this month was kind of weird because we've already had the first Monday, but we didn't have the first Sunday. That's today. So our time of fasting and prayer is always the first Sunday, Monday, Tuesday of the month. So we want to remind you, uh, fasting and prayer. Uh, uh, today and tomorrow and Tuesday. And we're also going to be gathering tomorrow evening uh, instead of our regular Monday night study in the book of Mark. We will be having our, our prayer walk um, that we normally do the, that Monday night. And so uh, at 7 o'clock, we want you to gather with us right here online and we're going to be doing our special prayer time. So we want you to, to avail yourself of that and, and be part of that um, special prayer time as well. So just thank you again for, for your faithfulness uh, to, to the services. We thank you for your faithfulness in giving. Uh, we thank you for your encouraging word. And let me, let me just um, ask you, if you would, to uh, just share the love and pick up the phone and just call your fellow congregation members and just say, hey, I'm thinking about you. I love you. Want to check on you. Everything good? Um, can we do anything for you? Just encourage one another. That's what uh, we need to be doing uh, during this time, and that's what we need to be doing all the time. So um, we just we just thank you again just for being here. So um, I want to do a, a song as we open up tonight. This is a um, this is a newer song. Um, and when I first heard this song, I thought. Mm, I gotta go back and I gotta I gotta dig through that a little bit more. I gotta dig through it just a little bit and, and kind of see exactly what it's talking about. And and oh wow, there is such richness 
um, from the scripture in the psalm. And um, it, it's basically meant to be an encouragement, meant to be an encouragement for us to understand that, you know what, there is absolutely nothing that's impossible with Jesus. Absolutely nothing. And whatever you may have on your plate right now that you feel like is, is just too much on your plate right now or a circumstance that you're needing to deal with, remember there's nothing that is too difficult for Jesus. There's nothing too difficult for our God. You know, the psalmist David, um, he said, he turned my mourning into dancing in the book of Psalms chapter 30. And Isaiah says, he gave me beauty for ashes. And Ezekiel, I mean, he took a, a, a valley of dry bones and he created an army out of that and and don't forget back in in the book of exodus with moses he took a he took a sea and he made a highway right straight through it if god can do these things surely there is nothing that we have there's nothing we have need of that is too big or that is impossible for our god to do so i just want you to be encouraged um, as we sing the song tonight and just want you to just to worship the Lord with us as we do that, okay? I think you'll recognize it. It's been it's been getting a lot of play lately um, on the on the radio, and um, I, I think you'll probably recognize it. So just pray it will bless your heart and you join in. The the chorus is real simple, so you'll pick it up very easy.
right where you're at. Will you pray that prayer with us that whatever you have in your house, whatever need you have, that God would fill that place with His presence. Father, we just pray for healing of the body. Lord, their family situations that you know all about. God, that are very private people. Lord, your healing power can walk into that house right now and touch that family member. You can heal that broken heart. Touch that one, God, that is going through treatments. May your spirit move upon their life in a special way. And may the place they're at be a holy place. And those that are searching for a deeper relationship with you, may they find it as they seek after you. In thy name we pray. Amen. Bibles with you tonight, turn with me to the book of Mark, chapter 6. Mark, chapter 6, verse 45. When you turn in there, you're going to find a very familiar story. Jesus has just fed the 5,000. Uh, matter of fact, many commentators tell us that it was probably Fifteen to 20,000 because you're counting just the men. He's fed them with a few fish, a few loaves of bread. And he then tells his disciples to get into a boat and separate themselves from him. He wants to stay in the mountain and he wants to pray. But I want you with me tonight, and I'm going to point out the main point at the very beginning, and I want you to look at that throughout the whole time that we study this tonight. I, I have a, I've had a lot of extra time to read, a lot of extra times to just meditate and spend time in God's Word and time with old authors that, that I, I've enjoyed reading and reading the writings, and when I read this, there was a few words in this scripture, this text, it just caught me off guard, and I had to go back and really concentrate and look at it, and I feel like God's maybe wanting to share something with us. Mark chapter 6, starting at verse 45, and I'm going to read through verse 54. Straightway, he constrained his disciples to get into the ship, to go to the other side before under Bethsaida, while he sent away the people. When he had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. And when the evening was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and he alone on the land he is in the mountain praying. That's what the previous verse says. And verse 48, I don't know how many times I've read it before and just kind of read over it, probably like you have. But look what it says. He's in the mountain praying. They're in the boat. He saw them towing, toiling, and rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them, and before the fourth watch of the night, he cometh unto them walking upon the sea, and would have passed by them. Get this picture. God is on the mountain praying. God has sent his people away, the 5,000 men, women, and children, and you know, like I said, we're a huge crowd. He sent those away. He constrains his disciples to leave him alone. You leave me here, you get in the boat, you go to the other side. We see this, but did you see what I just read? Verse 48, he saw them. He watched them as they were fighting the storm. He watched them, and he saw them toiling and rowing, for the wind was contrary to them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he waited for hours to go to them. He watched them fight the storm for hours, and he was in the mountain alone praying. 
The Bible says and goes on to say, verse 49, but when they saw him walking upon the sea, they supposed it had been a spirit and cried out. For they all saw him and were troubled. And immediately he talked with them and said unto them, Be of good cheer. It is I, again, the I am that we talked about this morning. Be not afraid. And he went up to them and to the ship. The wind ceased. And they were so amazed in themselves beyond measure. And they wondered. It's been a busy day for Jesus. He's fed the 5,000 like I shared with you. And he has constrained his disciples to get into the boat and go to the other side. He's going to the mountain to pray. And we get a glimpse of why. If you go back and look at the book of John chapter 6, verse 15. John 6, 15 says, When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into the mountain himself alone. Jesus knew the time had not come for him to be the king of this world. Matter of fact, his kingdom was not of this world. And they wanted him... There was a frenzy because of the miracles of taking a few fish and a few loaves of bread and literally feeding thousands. But then I want you to look at a very sad verse in the book of John chapter 6, verse 26. Jesus tells them why they want him to be their king. John 6, 26. Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, seek me not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. He said, you follow me because I feed you. You're not following me because of the miracles, but you, you follow me because I can provide food. Now, we have to realize that we've been studying through the book of Mark that miracles were signs and wonders to follow them that, that, so that they would believe Jesus. Jesus then turns the table on them here and says, you're not following me because of the divine miracles. You seek me not because you saw the miracles. You seek me not because you saw the blinded eyes open, the withered hand healed, the lame walk, the leper cleaned. That's not why you're following me. But because you did eat of the loaves and were filled, he said, you follow me for me to fulfill a physical need. You want me to use the supernatural to continue to break bread, continue to multiply fish and to meet your immediate need rather than letting your spiritual need be met. It's a very sad verse when you look at it. So Jesus sends his disciples away. He constrains them to go into the boat. And then he disperses this crowd that is really warning him for the wrong reason. And then he goes to the mountain to pray. He's seeking God's direction and guidance. And, but I think also we overlook something. We, we look at this and say, okay, he sent the disciples away so that he could disperse the crowd he didn't want to be their king. He didn't want to do the miracles of feeding them. He didn't want that. He wanted them to follow him for the right reason. Yes, I agree 100% with that. But what I started really looking at is there's another reason. The disciples were sent away so that they could quit doubting and having unbelief in any circumstances of life. Jesus used this storm to reveal not only his deity and his power to them because he's going to walk out on the water to them, but what he's doing is he is taking them to a place where they need to understand that storms of life are going to come. We're going to have things that we cannot control. We're going to have sicknesses that we cannot control. I had to deal with that myself. We're going to have moments in life that we cannot control. We're going to have situations that are totally out of our control. And we call them storms of life. Matter of fact, sometimes they come in as waves. They just come flooding in continuously over and over and over and over again. And it seems like you get one bad report, another bad report, another bad report. But all this time, God is wanting you and I to trust him. There are storms that we have in our home, 
There's storms that we have in our marriage. There's storms that a lot of people don't see, but we have to deal with them. Matter of fact, Job made a very strong proclamation in the book of Job. Chapter 14, verse 1, he says, Man that is born of woman is few of days and full of trouble. Man that is born of woman is few of days and full of trouble. Now, I've said it to you many times before, and I kind of age myself here, but there's that old hee-ho song that we used to sing, Who despair agony upon me? If I had no bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. And what it's really talking about, it's kind of like a song of life. It seems like everything happens. My refrigerator breaks down. The car breaks down. All my family's having this problem. This is person's having that problem. I'm having this physical problem. I'm having this financial problem. And, and we, we, we look at this and we say, God, these things are happening. But can I tell you something? Just as Jesus constrained the disciples to go into the boat and went into the storm, knew the storm was there, but he constrained them literally means that he drove them to that. The same way that Jesus went into the wilderness after he was baptized by, at the Jordan by John the Baptist, he went into the wilderness. He was led by the Holy Spirit. Understand with me, brothers and sisters, there are times that God will direct us in directions we really don't want to go. There are things that we're going through that we really, if we could have a pass, if we could just pass this area, or if we could just go around it, God, that's what we want. And so many times we're praying for God to take these things away from us, and God is looking down from heaven, and I want to be very transparent with you here. God is looking down from heaven and says, I'm watching you as you go through it. I need you to go through this. You're praying for a way out of it, and I'm wanting you to go through it because I want to make you into something that you don't think you're all, you are. I want your faith to rise to a level that you don't think it can arise to. I want you to trust me as we go through these storms together. Now, you got to realize the disciples have rode all day and rode way into the night. Jesus is not with them, but Jesus is watching them. Jesus is there. He knew the storm was coming. Matter of fact, Paul would say to the church in Corinth a very strong statement that sometimes we as God's people swallow very hard, but we have to swallow and we have to adjust to this. Go with me to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15 through 18. 2 Corinthians 4, 15 through 18. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through them thanksgiving of many renowned to the glory of God. For all things, good, bad, ugly, are for your sake. That the abundant grace might, through the thanksgiving of many, renown to the glory of God. For which cause, now think about this, we faint not. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. The outward man may be perishing. It may be physically taking its toll upon you and I. It may be manifesting itself even in our appearance. People will look at us and say there's changes upon you. There are drastic changes that we see. Matter of fact, we may look at a few pictures just of a few weeks, a few months, or a year back and see so many drastic things. The Bible says, for this cause, we faint not because the out, though the outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us as far more exceeding an eternal weight of glory. What I'm going through right now, what you're going through right now, no matter what kind of storm it is, it may be a spiritual storm, it may be a financial storm, 
It may be a physical storm. It may be a storm of things that you've never seen, a proportion you've never seen before. God says, through Paul, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, for all things are for your sake. Then we drop down at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us for a more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So in my storm, I'm rowing with everything inside of me. I'm fighting. I don't think God is with me. God has constrained me. He has sent me in that direction. But I can tell you, God is on the mountain looking down at me and seek and praying on my behalf that maybe the physical man cannot understand what's taking place. But I'm growing in spirit and in knowledge and an understanding that God is in complete control. Go back to the text with me for just a moment. The Bible says in Mark chapter 6, verse 46, And when he had seen them away, he departed and sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. And when evening was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea, and he alone on the land. Verse 48, go back and look at it. He saw them tolling in rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them, and about the fourth watch of the night he cometh unto them, walking upon the sea, and would have passed by them. Jesus was watching while his disciples were rowing against the wind. The waves in the Sea of Galilee was overwhelming them. Jesus had gone up to the mountain to pray. But I think his vantage point also was not that he was there to pray for his father, for what his will to be done, for him to follow him and direct him. But I think he also, the Bible says he was watching them. And can I just personalize this a minute? He was watching them rowing against that wind, rowing as hard as they could in that boat, and he was miles away from them. And he was praying something like this. God, give them strength. God, give them strength. May they not doubt. May they believe. May they continue to press forward, to press through this storm. This storm is only temporary. Teach them, God, to press through it. I can just sense that as he watched them. But as he watched them, we understand that everything was happening for a purpose. He saw the struggles. He saw the anxieties. He saw what was happening. And then it's interesting. He walks down from the mountain. Get this. He walks down from the mountain and he walks on the storms to them. He walks on the water and the Bible says that he's about to pass by them. Now, when we look at this, we even find in some texts that they say that they thought he was a ghost. And I want you to understand a very simple thought here that as I was reading this, there are many times that Jesus is standing right in front of us and we don't even see him. He is walking right along beside us in the very storm that we're in, but we're so preoccupied with existing in the storm that his very presence is right there and we don't even notice it. He did not identify himself. They thought he was a ghost. But when I go through the storms of life, not only is he interceding on my behalf, not only is he walking with me, not only has he gone ahead of me, but he is there. He is right there. I'm convinced that not only when he was on the mountain praying, 
I think that, and, and we, it's interesting to me, as he's walking on the water, I think he's praying as he's walking towards them as well. We won't find that in any commentaries. We won't find that in any scriptures. But in my heart, I, I just believe that God was just praying and interceding on their behalf that they would not doubt, they would not fear. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews, chapter 7, verse 25, Wherefore he is able to save them to the uttermost to come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. I want you to understand with me tonight that no matter what you're going through, Jesus, according to what we know in God's word, is sitting on the right hand of the Father tonight, interceding on my behalf and your behalf. What has happened in our nation the last 10 to 12 weeks did not catch God off guard. What has happened to our nation the last few days has not caught God off guard. But what can happen is in the middle of the storm, we can quit looking for him and he is walking right there by us. Can I remind you of something? Jesus said to you and I, he would send the comforter, the Holy Spirit, that would come alongside. And Jesus even made this proclamation, I must leave so that he can come. But he also said that I will never leave you nor forsake you. So as we're looking at the storms and we see things that don't look like God, God is still there. It doesn't hear like what we think God ought to sound like. God is still there. He is walking in these storms with us right now. And he's praying. The Holy Spirit is here with us. The Comforter is here with us. I cannot, I cannot stress to you enough, and I said it this morning, I feel that God has been dealing with us as individuals and as the body, and he warned us to be on our knees for weeks, and that's where he put us there. He's trying to talk to us, and now in the midst of what in right now as a nation, God is still trying to talk to us. He is in the midst of this storm with you and I right this very second. Whatever's taking place, God is and he is praying on our behalf. He is interceding for us. And the Lord ministered to those men in the midst of that storm. But I want you to go back to the text with me tonight. In the book of Mark, chapter 6, verse 48. When he saw them tolling and rowing for the wind was contrary to them, about the fourth watch of the night he cometh unto them walking upon the sea have passed by them but they saw him think about that a moment they would have he would have passed by them now I want you to swallow something here there are times that God is right in front of us and we don't see we're not looking for him. We're not looking for him. The Bible says, walking on the sea and would have passed right by them. Would have walked right by them. And that's what the scripture says. But when they saw him walking on the sea, first of all, they thought it was a spirit. But I want you to look what they did next. They cried out. And then verse 50 they got their eyes off the storm and they realized that it was not their imagination. They realized that it was not the, a spirit. But the Bible says in verse 50, I want you to look very carefully, for they all saw him. They all quit rowing and quit fighting and they all saw him and they were troubled. And immediately he talked with them and said unto them, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. For they all saw him and were troubled. And immediately he talked with them and said unto them, Be of good cheer, it is I. Or that I am the all-sufficient one. 
be not afraid. And he went up to them in the ship, and the storm stopped. The winds ceased. And they were so amazed at themselves beyond measure, they wondered. They were out there struggling alone. They were in a group. We understand that there were a group of men there struggling, and they all were of the same faith. They were followers of Christ, but there was unbelief in their heart. There was disobedience that they had to work with. There were things that they had to deal with in their own timing. Jesus pushed them into a situation that would make them greater individuals spiritually. He promised us that he would never leave us. And he promised them he would never leave them. We will never weather the storm alone. When he said, it is I, he literally said to them, the I am, the all-sufficient one, has arrived upon the scene. And then he commanded them to stop being afraid. He commanded them to stop being afraid. Go back to the text. Mark chapter 6, verse 50 and 51. For they all put their eyes back upon Jesus, saw him and were troubled, and immediately he talked with them and saith unto them, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. He went up unto them in the ship. He literally stepped out of the water into the ship. The very storm that they could not control was the very storm that he walked upon to get there. The very circumstance that was out of their control was the very circumstance he used to go to them. It propelled him to them, and they were looking at it from a very negative way. And then he whispers something, peace, be still. He went up unto them into the ship, and the wind ceased, and they were so amazed in themselves, and they were beyond measure, and they wondered. That's interesting to me. They could have, they could have done all kind of different things. But i got to ask you, do storms not terrify you? Does the unknown not terrify you? When we hear of things that we cannot see, it causes us to be afraid. And I'm going to be very transparent with you, with you here just a moment. We cannot see the coronavirus. And it scares people. I understand that. But it's the unseen. But can I say this to you and you and I understand it? Faith is unseen as well. We walk by faith. We walk by the unseen. And the very unseen things that are, that are in front of us are the very things that God may have been using to speak to us individually, but we were not looking for Him. We were looking at, for answers in all different directions, and God has been walking with you all the way through it. Let me say this very candidly to some of you just like myself. God has protected you, hasn't He? God has walked with you. God has provided. God has made a way when you didn't think there would be a way. God, the job may not have been there, but the finances may not have been there, but God's provided, hasn't He? The great I Am has been there. And He is speaking peace to you and I. And we step out of that storm into another storm that our nation is stepping into now. And we understand that these storms are very spiritual. The cloud is very heavy. But I want you to understand something with me tonight. Jesus is on the right hand of the Father, interceding on my behalf and in your behalf, and He is watching us as we're rowing through the storms. He is watching us as we're fighting contrary winds, contrary false things, and things that we thought we would never fight, tribulations that we've read about our whole life, but never thought that our generation would see them. He is watching us. And I am saying to you tonight, as he has been saying to me the last few days, 
You are not in this boat alone. I have been watching you. I am with you, and I am going before you, and I will make a way. I want you to understand, and I want to be very transparent with you right here. When this first happened and the churches could not gather together, my very first thought, and, and, and I hope you understand, was what will we do for our missionaries? How will we provide for our missionaries? I was not so much concerned about the church, but in that storm, my eyes got misdirected, and all at once, God started telling me, I've got this. And he provided in ways that are amazing to me, and he brought peace to me, and then all at once, we started seeing God's people. We may not have been together, we may not have been in the same boat, but we're fighting the same storms and I really think that each one of us in our own way has now started to look and we're starting to see Jesus through this. Maybe some of us have caught on a little sooner than others. Maybe some still hadn't quite caught it. Maybe you're in a situation right now that you're still dealing with. But I promise you one thing. Jesus is here. He has not left us. He has not forsaken us. The gates of hell will not prevail against his church and his people. And it's you and I. And then I'm reminded of this as I close tonight. The book of Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 through 9. Very familiar text. If I can learn to recognize his presence, even while I'm in the storm, I'll have peace that passes all understanding. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 through 9. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, do you hear that? In everything, good, bad, ugly, in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And then verse 7, the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things, those things which you have been both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Go back to the text. Mark chapter 6, verse 48. And he saw them toiling and rowing, for the wind was contrary to them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he cometh unto them walking on the sea, and would have passed by. But when they saw him walking upon the sea, they supposed it had been a spirit and cried out, for well, they all saw him and were troubled and immediately he talked with them and he saith unto them, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. We've got to put our eyes back upon Jesus because he has been watching the whole time. Whatever you're going through personally, he's in that storm with you. Whatever you're going through as a church family or a body of believers, he's in that storm with us. He is with us tonight. He's with us. Father, I pray that we'll put our eyes upon you. We're not looking for you right now in some things. And when we see what we think might be you, we say it's not. We say it's some spiritual thing that it's out of control and it's you all alone. And you're wanting to say to you and I, peace, be still. It is I. I am with you in this storm. So whatever storm they're in tonight, may they know that you're with them.
Pastor, thank you for that word. Just want to encourage you, if, if maybe you find yourself exactly where Pastor has talked about tonight and you find yourself in that storm um, and you feel like you're alone, even though you know you're not, you feel like you're alone, you know, um, pick up the phone, okay? Call us, text us, let us pray with you. Um, let, us, let us stand with you. Um, encourage one another. Uh, don't forget, tomorrow night we're going to have our, our prayer walk here together, so we want you to join us at 7. Thank you so much. God bless you. We love you all. We'll see you again soon. Bye-bye.